Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Mark chapter 14, and I'm going to start at, at verse 3. I'm going to be reading verses 3 through 11. And the he that's being spoken of here is Jesus, and this is what it says. And while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, and reclining at table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, for what purpose has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good. Do them good. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world... That also which this woman has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. And Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. Pray with me. Lord, use this day, use this time that you might speak directly to our hearts, not just our heads, but to our hearts, and we might be transformed by it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that's a big place. Wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that what this woman has done will be spoken of in memory of her. And sure enough, this story is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A case could be made that this was the story that, that the early church was more familiar with, more so than any other story other than the crucifixion and the resurrection. And I'll tell you how a case could be made like that. Is that in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, the writer, John, is going to introduce the story of Lazarus. And when he says, someone came to, to Jesus saying, Lazarus is sick, he has a little commentary beside it. He said, this is Lazarus whose sister Mary anointed Jesus. Well, what's peculiar about it is that John hasn't told the story yet. He's referencing the story by, uh, with a story that they already knew. It wouldn't make any sense to reference a story with a story they didn't know. He, hasn't told, he doesn't tell the story until chapter 11. That we reference things by things that are greater, more well-known, <laughs> rather than something no one had ever heard of before. That Lazarus, whose sister Mary anointed Jesus, was sick. Well, Jesus and his disciples went to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, with his sisters Mary and Martha. And Lazarus was no longer sick. He had been dead for four days. And Jesus called for the stone to be rolled away. But one of Lazarus' sisters, Martha, 
said, no, Lord. You don't hear that very often, but it's a, no, Lord, for there will be a stench. I like the way the King James Version puts it better. It says, no, Lord, for he stinketh. <laughs> you put a TH on the end of any word, and it just sounds a little better, doesn't it? He, he stinketh. <laughs> well, well, Jesus didn't, didn't listen. He, he had the stone rolled away anyway. And he said, Lazarus, come out. And out walked Lazarus after having been dead for four days. Death let go of his grip, and, and there was Lazarus. And, and can you imagine how word spread of Jesus having, having raised Lazarus four days dead in the grave? And, and, and the very next day in Bethany, Lazarus' hometown, that's what we read this morning. That at the home of Simon the leper, at the beginning of the Passover, they're having a party. Now, I say Simon the leper. He's probably known as just plain old Simon now. Because he's having a party at his house, he, he's, Jesus has cleansed him from his leprosy. And I imagine Simon leaning out, looking at all the people in his his home, and people are leaning in to listen to Jesus tell one more story, and that's when she does it. That's when then Mary comes and, and she, she pours this alabaster vial of costly perfume of pure nard. N nard is the name of the perfume. Nard. Somebody ought to do a little bit of a marketing campaign. I, Anything named nard is not something you really want to wear on a date, is it? Uh, it's, you really don't want to wear something named, called nard out of the house. Well, you would never have to because nard wasn't meant for date night. Nard was meant for burial. Nard was so strong it was meant to cover up the stench of death. And that's what Mary was pouring on Jesus. Nard, worth over 300 denarii, worth over a year's wages. And people, it says here that they, in the room, everyone began to scold her and tell her that this could have been given to the poor. What a waste to, get, to, to pour out something this valuable, something like this. And that, I said everybody began to scold her. That is except Jesus. And he said, let her alone. She has done a good deed to me. Now, that's not a throwaway line right there. That in Greek, which this was written, that there were two words for good. And one of those words for good was, was the word agathos. And agathos is a, is a moral good. But that's not the word used here. He's not saying she's done a morally good thing for me. It's, the word that's used is kalos. And kalos is something beautiful. Something that's lovely. Something that has the quality and texture of, of, of a gracious, loving kindness. That she's done something wonderful and beautifully good. And then he goes on to say, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken of in memory of her. And she's more highly commended than anyone else in the New Testament by Jesus. What an incredible good that must be. And the very next words in verse 10 are, and Judas. And I thought, wow, you talk about a mood breaker. I mean, that's just, <laughs> we're talking about this beautiful, lovely act of, of gracious, loving kindness and goodness and and Judas. I mean, it's just, it's buzzkill, right? Just, just, it's like getting punched right in the middle of the story. And I'm thinking, well, maybe Mark's just having a bad story day. And to introduce Judas in the middle of a beautifully good story like this, and Judas. So I look to John. John tells the story of Judas in the exact same place at the end of the story of Mary. And he doesn't say, and I'd like to tell you another story. No, he starts with the word, but Judas. So I look to Matthew. Matthew tells the story in the same place. And it says, then Judas. That side by side, these stories are placed. It's a literary device called juxtaposition. I've always wanted to use that word in a sermon. 
And now you hear it. You ask your friends, if your friends ask, well, what was the sermon about? Just say, well, we talked about juxtaposition. Yeah, it, side by side, two things that are put for the contrast, to, to give an emphasis, to give a power, to give a strength to the story. This beautiful story and Judas, then Judas, but Judas, right next to it. I mean, why? Why, why, why stick Judas in the middle of a beautiful story? We know Judas. Judas is the most despicable person in history. Hands down, public enemy number one. You guys, people don't name their children after Judas. They just don't name their children Judas anymore. I, there was a time where a lot of people named their children Judas, but nope, after this, that stopped. Any picture, painting of Judas, of, of Jesus with the disciples, there are two folks you can pick out immediately. One is Jesus. He's the one with the halo, just in case you didn't know. And the other one, Judas. Looks like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. And uh, it's just an evil, look, uh, ready to say, here's Johnny. Uh, it's just, uh, he's despicable. And you can tell from looking at him that he's despicable. You know it, I know it, everybody knows it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, in the 1300s when Dante wrote that. Dante's Inferno, he said there was a special place in hell for Judas where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and just burning brimstone and jazz played badly and cats everywhere. And I might have added some of this, not much, but at least I know there was a lot of boiled okra there. It's just a horrible, horrible, horrible place set aside for the most despicable person in history. Judas, we know Judas. Judas is that person that we can always compare ourselves to and come out smelling like a rose. Judas is that person that's always worse than we are. Judas is that person that we can feel pretty, pretty good with ourselves as long as Judas is around. I mean, we can't, at least we're not that bad. Judas is the one that urges us to have faith, well, faith without Jesus, to be good without God, because we're, at least we're better than Judas. At least we're better than Judas. But a question, if we really know Judas, I mean, we, we all know Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but one of those pieces of silver is called the shekel, and 30 of them is worth about $21, less than the cost of dinner and a movie. So was Judas just so low down and dirty that he would betray the person that he quit his job for to follow, the person that for three years he had been wandering around Galilee with, was he just so low down and dirty that for the cost of dinner and a movie, he was selling him out? Maybe, but that caused me to, to dig a little bit more. And I discovered that the name Judas Iscariot is very, very, very unusual. Because in the ancient world, you were either named after your father, like Simon Bar-Jonah, which means Simon, son of Jonah, or you were named for the town you were from, like Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea is a, is a town, a place. And the name Judas Iscariot is neither a name nor is it a town. Many scholars believe that, that the word Iscariot is a play on the word Sakari. Sakari, which literally means dagger carrier. This was a group of folks that they were assassins. And they carried a dagger just for the opportunity to kill a tax collector or a Roman official. That over in the shadows when no one was watching, or maybe in a big crowd where no one could detect who it was, they could pull out the dagger and assassinate. And that, that Judas... Rather than just being so greedy that he wanted $21, maybe he had an agenda, a political agenda. And following Jesus meant that 
Jesus was going to be the one to fulfill his agenda, what he wanted. That once and for all, that he was going to knock the Roman slap out of Jerusalem and all the way out of Israel. That Jesus had the power to do that. After all, he'd seen him raise Lazarus four days dead from the grave. And now, rather than following Jesus, he's pushing Jesus. And he's pushing these two things in front of Jesus. Okay, Jesus, now's your time. Pick, choose. What will it be? Is it us or is it them? Who are you going to support? Those who are behind the temple or these pagan, these pagan occupiers, these Romans that are in our country? Which one is it? Is it us or them? The Jews or the pagans? That Judas, rather than following, Jesus was, was pushing, pushing Jesus to endorse his agenda to endorse his plan, to endorse his good, his good, to decide between us and them. And Jesus didn't turn to Judas and say, you've done a good deed. Didn't turn to Jesus and to Judas and, and say, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, no, that That part of Judas, well, that's something that comes natural to all of us. To rather than follow Jesus, to try and be good without God, to try and have faith without Jesus, to point to somebody with a worse record and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as they are. I must be okay. Jesus did turn to the woman. And say, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken of in her memory. Jesus did turn and say, she has done a a good deed, a beautiful deed, a, a lovely thing, a good and a gracious, something that has the quality of loving kindness. That's what she's done. Well, what is it that she's done? Well, we read she she poured this this vial of pure nard worth over 300 denarii. What she poured was perfume that was meant for burial. Well, you remember where we started? That her sister said, no, Jesus, don't roll back the stone for he stinketh. Why would he stinketh if she had used the nard that was meant for her brother? No, what she did was... She had withheld in her own selfishness. She had a secret. A secret that was a secret that was revealed when that stone was rolled away, or would have been revealed when the stone was rolled away. But now it was her secret and Jesus' secret only. And now she was pouring it out. Now she was pouring out the shame of her own selfishness. That she had hoarded something that was, was meant for her brother. That she had held on to that thing that was not her own. She had held on to her sin and now in surrender she was pouring it out to Jesus. And in pouring out the shame and pouring out the shadow and pouring out the secret and pouring out the sin... It became something beautiful, something lovely. It was transformed into a a gracious good. Something that had the, the quality of loving kindness and worship. And that's what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. He took the secret. He took the shame. He took the shadow. And when we surrender, when we let go of it and pour it all to Him, He's able to change even that that's worse into that that's most beautiful, most lovely, most gracious, and that has the quality of loving kindness. He's able to to change, to transform you and me. This morning... It may be that God's given you a nudge, that there's something you've been holding back, 
And you've, you've, you've been trying to keep that secret in the shadows, trying to keep it hidden. Maybe you've used Ju- Judas, Judas to keep it hidden for a long time because he's more despicable, he's worse than you are, but you've still held on to it. You've still tried to, to justify it. That maybe it's, it's really not there. And, and if you point to somebody with the worst record, maybe nobody will really notice. And you've tried to be good without God. Or you've tried faith without Jesus. And this morning, it may be that God's given you a nudge. And He's called you to surrender. To surrender, to pour it out, to let it go. And allow Jesus to make something beautiful, something beautiful in your life. I want to pray with you, and I want to pray with you now. Let's pray. Jesus, this world we live in, search us, O God, and know our hearts. Try us and know our thoughts. And if there's any wicked way in us, Lord, may we not point to someone who's more wicked. Lord, if there's any wicked way in us, Lord, may we, not, may we not try and be good without you. Lord, if there's any wicked way in us, may we not try and say, well, well, Lord, choose between the least wicked so we can still hold on to that that really is shame, selfishness, that that really is sinful. Lord, cleanse us. Cleanse us this day and begin to to transform, to transform in us that that rather than pointing to Jesus, we might point all, rather than pointing to Judas, we might point all people to you. That we might point all people to you with, with that that's lovely, that that that's beautiful, that what comes out of our mouths may be a gracious, loving kindness. What results from our actions might not be the better of two evils, but it might be truly from you, Lord. Because when you rose from the grave, you you chose to live your life through us. Start that life, that new life, that resurrection life this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.